Hi guys, welcome to day seven of the read aloud. So yesterday, um, when we were reading, they had Harry Potter had just gotten to the Quidditch field for the first time. Too eager to fly again to wait for Wood, Harry mounted his broomstick and kicked off from the ground. What a feeling! He swooped in and out of the goalposts and then sped up and down the field. The Nimbus two thousand turned whenever he wanted at his lightest touch. Harry, hey, Potter, come on down. Oliver Wood had arrived. He was carrying a large wooden crate under his arm. Harry landed next to him. Very nice, said Wood, his eyes glinting. I see what McGonagall meant. You really are a natural. I'm just going to teach you the rules this evening. Then you'll be joining team practice three times a week. He opened the crate. Inside were four different sized balls. Right, said Wood. Now, Quidditch is easy enough to understand, even if it's not too easy to play. There are seven players on each side. Three of them are called chasers. Three chasers, Harry repeated as Wood took out a bright red ball about the size of a soccer ball. This ball is called the quaffle, said Wood. The chasers throw the quaffle to each other and try to get it through one of the hoops to score a goal. Ten points every time the quaffle goes through one of the hoops. Follow me. The chasers throw the quaffle and put it through the hoops to score, Harry recited. So that's sort of like basketball and broomsticks with six hoops, isn't it? What's basketball, said Wood curiously. Never mind, said Harry quickly. Now, there's another player on each side who's called the keeper. I'm keeper for Gryffindor. I have to fly around our hoops and stop the other team from scoring. Three chasers, one keeper, said Harry, who was determined to remember it all. And they play with the quaffle. Okay, got that. So what are they for? He pointed at the three balls left inside the box. I'll show you now, said Wood. Take this. He handed Harry a small club. A bit like a short baseball bat. I'm going to show you what the bludgers do, Wood said. These two are the bludgers. He showed Harry two identical balls, jet black and slightly smaller than the red quaffle. Harry noticed that they seemed to be straining to escape the straps holding them inside the box. Stand back, Wood warned Harry. He bent down and freed one of the bludgers. At once, the black ball rose high in the air and then pelted straight at Harry's face. Harry swung at it with the bat to stop it from breaking his nose and sent it zigzagging away into the air. It zoomed around their heads and then shot at Wood, who dived on top of it and managed to pin it to the ground. See? Wood panted, forcing the struggling bludger back into the crate and strapping it down safely. The bludgers rocket around, trying to knock players off their brooms. That's why you have two beaters on each team. The Weasley twins are ours. It's their job to protect their side from the bludgers and try and knock them toward the other team. So, think you got all that? Three chasers try and score with the quaffle. The keeper guards the goalposts. The beaters keep the bludgers away from their team, Harry reeled off. Very good, said Wood. Um, have the bludgers ever killed anyone, Harry asked, hoping he sounded offhand. Never at Hogwarts. We've had a couple of broken jaws, but nothing worse than that. Now, the last member of the team is the seeker. That's you. And you don't have to worry about the quaffle or the bludgers, unless they crack my head open. Don't worry, the Weasleys are more than a match for the bludgers. I mean, they're like a pair of human bludgers themselves. Wood reached into the, to the crate and took out the fourth and last ball. Compared with the quaffle and the bludgers, it was tiny, about the size of a large walnut. It was bright gold and had little fluttering silver wings. This, said Wood, is the golden snitch, and it's the most important ball in the lot. It's very hard to catch because it's so fast and difficult to see. It's the seeker's job to catch it. You've got to weave in and out of the chasers, beaters, bludgers, and quaffle to get it before the other team seeker, because whichever seeker catches the snitch wins his team an extra 150 points, so they nearly always win. That's why seekers get fouled so much. A game of Quidditch only ends when the snitch is caught so it can go on for ages. I think the record is three months. They had to keep bringing on substitutes so the players could get some sleep. Well, that's it. Any questions? Harry shook his hand. He understood what he had to do, all right. It was doing it that was going to be the problem. We won't practice with the snitch yet, said Wood carefully, shutting it back inside the crate. It's too dark. We might lose it. Let's try you out with a few of those. He pulled a bag of ordinary golf balls out of his pocket, and a few minutes later, he and Harry were up in the air, Wood throwing the golf balls as hard as he could in every direction for Harry to catch. Harry didn't miss a single one, and Wood was delighted. After half an hour, night had fallen, and night had really fallen, and they couldn't carry on. 
That Quidditch couple have our name on it this year, said Wood happily as they trudged back up to the castle. I wouldn't be surprised if you turned out better than Charlie Weasley, and he could have played for England if he hadn't gone off chasing dragons. Perhaps it was because he was now so busy, what with Quidditch practice three evenings a week, on top of all his homework. But Harry could hardly believe it when he realized he'd already been at Hogwarts two months. The castle felt more like home than Privet Drive ever had. His lessons, too, were becoming more and more interesting now that they had mastered the basics. On Halloween morning, they woke to the delicious smell of baking pumpkin wafting through the corridors. Even better, Professor Flitwick announced in charms that he thought they were ready to start making objects fly, something they had all been dying to try since they'd seen him make Neville's toad zoom around the classroom. Professor Flitwick put the class into pairs to practice. Harry's partner was Seamus Finnegan, which was a relief because Neville had been trying to catch his eye. Ron, however, was to be working with Hermione Granger. It was hard to tell whether Ron or Hermione was angrier about this. She hadn't spoke to either of them since the day Harry's broomstick had arrived. Now don't forget that nice wrist movement we've been practicing, squeaked Professor Flitwick, perched on top of his pile of books as usual. Swish and flick. Remember, swish and flick. And saying the magic words properly is very important, too. Never forget Wizard Barufio, who said S instead of and found himself on the floor with a buffalo on his chest. It was very difficult. Harry and Seamus swished and flicked, but the feather they were supposed to be sending skyward just lay on the desktop. Seamus got so impatient that he prodded it with his wand and set fire to it. Harry had to put it out with his hat. Ron, at the next table, wasn't having much more luck. Wingardium Leviosa, he shouted, waving his long arms like a windmill. You're saying it wrong, Harry heard Hermione stop. It's wing gar diem leviosa. Make the gar nice and long. You do it then if you're so clever, Ron snarled. Hermione rolled up the sleeves of her gown, flicked her wand, and said, Wingardium leviosa. Their feather rose off the desk and hovered about four feet above their heads. Oh, well done, cried Professor Flitwick, clapping. Everyone see here, Miss Granger's done it. Ron was in a very bad mood by the end of class. It's no wonder no one can stand her, he said to Harry as they pushed their way into the crowded corridor. She's a nightmare, honestly. Someone knocked into Harry as they hurried past him. It was Hermione. Harry caught a glimpse of her face and was startled to see that she was in tears. I think she heard you. So, said Ron, but he looked a bit uncomfortable. She must have noticed she's got no friends. Hermione didn't turn up for the next class and wasn't seen all afternoon. On their way down to the Great Hall for the Halloween feast, Harry and Ron overheard Parvati Patil telling her friend Lavender that Hermione was crying in the girls' bathroom and wanted to be left alone. Ron looked still more awkward at this, but a moment later they had entered the Great Hall where the Halloween de decorations put Hermione out of their minds. A thousand live bats fluttered from the walls and ceiling while a thousand more swooped over the tables in low black clouds, making the candles and the pumpkins stutter. The feast appeared suddenly on the golden plates as it had at the start of term banquet. Harry was just helping himself to a baked potato when Professor Quirrell came sprinting into the hall, his turban askew and terror on his face. Everyone stared as he reached Professor Dumbledore's chair, slumped against the table and gasped. Troll! In the dungeons, thought you ought to know. He then sank to the floor in a dead faint. There was an uproar. It took several purple firecrackers exploding from the end of Professor, Dum Professor Dumbledore's wand to bring silence. Prefects, he rumbled, lead your houses back to the dormitories immediately. Percy was in his element. Follow me, stick together, first years. No need to fear the troll if you follow my orders. Stay close behind me now. Make way, first year's coming through. Excuse me, I'm a prefect. How could a troll get in, Harry asked as they climbed the stairs. Don't ask me, they're supposed to be really stupid, said Ron. Maybe Peeves let it in for a Halloween joke. They passed different groups of people hurrying in different directions. As they jostled their way through a crowd of confused Hufflepuffs, Harry suddenly grabbed Ron's arm. I just thought, Hermione, what about her? She doesn't know about the troll. Ron bit his lip. Oh, all right, he snapped, but Percy better not see us. Ducking down, they joined the Hufflepuffs going the other way, slipped down a deserted side corridor, and hurried off towards the girls' bathroom. 
They had just turned the corner when they heard quick footsteps behind them. Percy, hissed Ron, pulling Harry behind a large stone griffin. Peering around it, however, they saw not Percy, but Snape. He crossed the corridor and disappeared from view. What's he doing, Harry whispered. Why isn't he down in the dungeons with the rest of the teachers? Search me. Quietly as possible, they crept along the next corridor after Snape's fading footsteps. He's heading for the third floor, Harry said, but Ron held his hand. Can you smell something? Harry sniffed, and a foul stench reached his nostrils, a mixture of old socks and the kind of public toilet no one seems to clean. And then they heard it, a low grunting and the shuffling footfalls of gigantic feet. Ron pointed at the end of a passage to the left. Something huge was moving toward them. They shrank into the shadows and watched as it emerged into a patch of moonlight. It was a horrible sight. Twelve feet tall, its skin was a dull granite gray. Its great lumpy body like a boulder with its small bald head perched on top like a coconut. It had short legs thick as tree trunks with flat horny feet. The smell coming from it was incredible. It was holding a huge wooden club which dragged along the floor because its arms were so long. The troll stopped next to a doorway and peered inside. It waggled its long ears, making up its tiny mind, then slouched slowly into the room. The key's in the lock, Harry muttered. We could lock it in. Good idea, said Ron nervously. They edged towards the door, mouths dry, praying the troll wasn't about to come out of it. With one great leap, Harry managed to grab the key, slam the door, and lock it. Yes! Flushed with their victory, they started to run back up the passage, but as they reached the corner, they heard something that made their hearts stop. A high, petrified scream, and it was coming from the chamber they'd just chained up. Oh no, said Ron, pale as the bloody baron. It's the girl's bathroom, Harry gasped. Hermione, they said together. It was the last thing they wanted to do, but what choice did they have? Wheeling around, they sprinted back to the door and turned the key, fumbling in their panic. Harry pulled the door open and they ran inside. Hermione Granger was shrinking against the wall opposite, looking as if she was about to faint. The troll was advancing on her, knocking the sinks off the walls as it went. Confuse it, Harry said desperately to Ron, and seizing a tap, he threw it as hard as he could against the wall. The troll stopped a few feet from Hermione. It lumbered around, blinking stupidly to see what had made the noise. Its mean little eyes saw Harry. It hesitated, then made for him instead, lifting its club as it went. Oi, pea brain, yelled Ron from the other side of the chamber, and he threw a metal pipe at it. The troll didn't even seem to notice the pipe hitting his shoulder, but it heard the yell and paused again, turning its ugly snout towards Ron, giving Harry time to run around it. Come on, run, run, Harry yelled at Hermione, trying to pull her towards the door, but she couldn't move. She was still flat against the wall, her mouth open with terror. The shouting and the echoes seemed to be driving the troll berserk. It roared again and started towards Ron, who was nearest and had no way to escape. Harry then did something that was both very brave and very stupid. He took a great running jump and managed to fast fasten his arms around the troll's neck from behind. The troll couldn't feel Harry hanging there, but even a troll will notice if you stick a long bit of wood up its nose, and Harry's wand had still been in his hand when he jumped. It had gone straight up one of the troll's nostrils. Howling with pain, the troll twisted and flailed its club with Harry clinging on for dear life. Any second, the troll was going to rip him off or catch him a terrible blow with the club. Hermione had sunk to the floor in fight. Ron pulled out his own wand, not knowing what he was going to do. He heard himself cry the first spell that came into his head. Wingardium Leviosa! The club flew suddenly out of the troll's hand, rose high, high up into the air, turned slowly over, and dropped with a sickening crack onto its owner's head. The troll swayed on the spot and then fell flat on its face with a thud that made the whole room tremble. Harry got to his feet. He was shaking and out of breath. Ron was standing there with his wand still raised, staring at what he had done. It was Hermione who spoke first. Is it dead? I don't think so, said Harry. I think it's just been knocked out. He bent down and pulled his wand out of the troll's nose. It was covered in what looked like lumpy gray glue. Ugh, troll boogers. He wiped it on the troll's trousers, and that's where we will stop today. See you tomorrow.